It's the 1033 program that started in the early 90s about giving yes. military weaponry to police officers. So about $6 billion we're giving to local law enforcement. And the idea here is that at some point in time in the United States, we made some decisions about law enforcement, about the role that police were going to play in the United States. And we started, we came up with this term paramilitary policing, meaning that police who are organized, presumably the idea that we have, police, although that's never been true really historically, but just, just, just go with me on this for a second. All right? Totally, yes. So the idea that police are organized to protect and to serve, to protect innocent people and to make sure they serve justice, right, and to enforce laws... <laughs> could best do that if they were trained paramilitary style, including have paramilitary weaponry. And so what does that do to a mentality of a society when you see police officers walking around like this instead of walking around with maybe even not a gun on their side? What does it do? Well, what happens is we developed this consciousness and this ideology in the United States. That, well, we need police like this because the world has become a violent place. It's more violent today than it ever has been at any point in history. But what if that's not true? Let me just say this, a couple of things, folks. First of all, for those of you who are out there like, oh, this is a typical partisan divide, I think that under President Obama was one of, you know, he, tr he contributed tremendously to the militarization of the police. All right. Tremendously. I was at Trump's inauguration. OK, during Trump's inauguration, there was all kinds of SWAT police there, fully militarized police, kettling people. Right. Who were peaceful protesters. I have the video footage I can show you. Those were those were hired by Obama, not Trump. Right. Because Trump wasn't even in yet. But to really get at it. Right. One of the things I've learned in Social 119 is how to confront facts to challenge what you already think. So I like facts. I like empirical arguments that we can and, and facts that we can we can verify because they're kind of cozy. Right. It's like they're right there and we have to face them. So one of the things you got to deal with with the police is where did the police come from? Right. What is the history of the police in this country? Right. I, I, most people, even a lot of criminal justice people don't even can't even tell you where the first police department was in this country. And when you study the history of the police, one of the things you find out is that policing really has a couple of different origin points. It's a kind of a complex history. Right. In fact, I'll tell you, we, some of you may already know in the South. Hold on. In the South. <clears throat> they started slave patrols. <laughs> right. That's that's only true in certain states, though. People think that oh, all the police are slave patrols. That's that's not the way to do that history. But it is true that in the Carolinas in Virginia, the slave patrols and police were very much intertwined institution because in the beginning of this country, there's no there's no the police. There's no police institution that looks like what you have now. People are like, oh, of course you have police. It's like, no, but not in not in the 18th century when America started. There wasn't uh, tanks rolling down the street. Right. There wasn't even if police patrols, you had constabulary systems, almost no police to speak of. So how do we get to this point where, you know, in my neighborhood in Philadelphia, it's you might see police coming in full military gear. Right. And as Sam said, what does that do when you claim you're supposed to serve a community, but you're coming in camouflage to a community and saying you're supposed to serve them and you're and you're the way that you envision yourself. Right. As an officer, as like a military soldier facing down an enemy, and you look like that to the people. I mean, it, it's just like no matter what you think, that's a difficult way to provide a kind of service. So, what's the history of that? And what you find is in the North, one of the things you find is that the first police forces really are hired by business people, right? They're hired as they're almost like private security forces. Study everybody in here, I want you to quickly Google. Pinkertons. Google the Pinkertons. 
This is the first detectives in the United States of America, the very first. Look at that history. The Pinkertons were hired for a lot of things, but they were primarily hired by people who owned coal mines. At one point in 1933, I just found out that the coal and steel owners had more of a military arsenal than the United States military. The steel owners did. Even one steel plant. My point is to say, police comes becomes a part of that history, and it be and the origins of the police really in the North are a military force to suppress working class people to make sure that labor doesn't rise up. Yeah, to control that, the workers. Yeah, that, that does is, to control workers. That, and, does, that this is historical historical facts, folks. So, yeah. Chance, when you said the the idea that you know in your neighborhood in Philly, you can have police going down the street in full tactical gear, which is what we're looking at in the photo here on the screen. And yeah, by the way, yeah, Jeff yeah. just sent you our PowerPoint, so you could open it up on a second screen screen if you yeah. Can. Uh, th this the question is what you he the response from people is well, of course. They need to dress like that. It's a really gotcha. dangerous job. And I respond, the world is less violent today than at any point in human history. Like, maybe they don't. Maybe that is an ideology that somebody else is putting into our heads so that we allow certain things to happen so that certain people can hold the reins of power and control everybody else and then divide us all. And so as long as we keep the people at the bottom divided and the police officers who are generally speaking not coming from upper class families, not coming from upper middle class families, and only until very recently are coming from working class families, we can keep everybody divided and then nobody's looking at anybody at the top. Watch this. This guy has a machete. These are cops in the UK. So here he is. He's chasing them. Look at all the cops here. They could shoot him in a second. In the U.S., he'd be dead already. But look how they don't have to. And I, I started looking at these videos. There was one after another, after another, after another. And you say, well, of course you have to shoot him. He's got a machete. He's dangerous. Look, they don't have to. And what this guy is saying here basically is, hey, this guy in the U.S., he's dead. He's already dead. We would have shot him 25 times. Why aren't they shooting him there? He's swinging a machete at him. Why is it that in our paramilitary policing, our way of dealing with this is to kill? He's mentally ill. He's a mentally ill human being. How many of you have people in your family who are mentally ill? It's like, and they go off their meds. And what happened? They should be killed? So he has a machete. So look, look at all those cops. They didn't have to kill him. Could have been two police officers. There are other videos where it's just a couple of police officers. And the guy comes at him with a gun and they just run in the other direction. Or the guy comes at him with a knife. And then they come back. And another person, the guy has a gun. And they just say, like, all right, we're just going to stay out of the way. And so this is the question, right? You say, we can't do that in the United States. Why can't we do that in the United States? How is it that most people in situations like this who come after the police in any way, are mentally ill. Just back off, close the door, take a couple minutes, and deal. figure out what we're going to do. Why do we just kill? What is the mentality? Like, I can totally understand if you're saying, why don't people just listen to the police officer? Then you could avoid all of this, right? I mean, this is what people would say, a lot of people who want to, you know, even in South Carolina, People would say, if people just listened to police officers, they wouldn't, and then they wouldn't do it. And it would just seem really simple. But the thing I would ask you just for a minute, if we could just get really present for a minute and think about compassion, being compassionate to people, if we could just get present. I spend a lot of time with the families of people who have lost people with law enforcement. Um, I don't want to be I don't want to use their stories in some kind of political way. But what I want what I want to let you know is these are whole lives that are being lost. And what we're saying when we compare them to like the people in the UK is, is it worth 20 more minutes of policing of back police backing away and using restraint? Is it worth an hour more to save a whole person's life? You know, to save a 19-year-old a, a kid, uh, Zachary Hammond, or 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 um, the kid in uh, Cleveland, Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, to save his life, to back back away for a minute and say, 
let him grow up because his 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 those mothers and and parents are just they deal with that every day imagining what their kids life would have been like today somebody who had mental health issue if they had been healed right what would their life being like today these are whole lives so when we think about this idea of if you if you resisted the police you deserve to die i mean when people if you look at the comments on some of those youtube videos about uk policing people are actually on there saying this is an inefficient use of resources. Those police should have shot those mentally ill people faster to save our money. Think about what that means. What, one thing that, that happens is I always try to be really compassionate to human beings and try to be hard on systems that don't work. Can we, can we accept for a moment we might have a system that doesn't work? If we have hundreds of, of people every year who, if they were in the UK, those people would be alive. And, Maybe and, we have a system that doesn't work. And the police who carry the burden of yes. what they have to do and what they do. Because once again, going back to what you first said, the police nine times, the vast majority of the time, and, then, and the reason police don't get prosecuted and this is what people miss. The vast majority of the time is because they followed procedures. They police follow procedures. They felt fear. But should they have been in that situation? When you look at Terrence um, Crutcher, who was a mentally, you know, who was who had a disability, called on the police and was killed. Should that officer have been in that situation? I mean, I want to tread carefully because, Sam, you said something like you, you kind of we talked about police as victims of this situation. I want to be crystal clear. Police who are killing people bear a different responsibility, right? But I remember talking to a chief of police, former chief of police on an airplane. I sat with him and we talked for two hours and we, we, we exchanged views. And one of the things that he made me understand and feel that I didn't feel is how much responsibility it is, it is to have a gun on you. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of responsibility. That's a burden. And what he made me understand is that's a traumatic burden to have a gun. And then now you're in a situation with that gun, fear, probably some training from some military people. And then now you got to deal with a situation and you and you kill somebody using your training following what you were taught. But the problem is what you were taught wasn't to prioritize human life, because all I'm offering, what I want us to, to think about is. If we say police's job is to protect and serve, one thing I see when I see, and I, I don't want to romanticize UK police. We can, they got to, they got to get some criticism too. But one thing you see in those situations is you start to envision them saying the most important priority here is that we don't hurt somebody who we're supposed to be serving. We want to protect other people. We want to protect ourselves, but we want to, we want to keep people alive if they don't have to die. 